Good morning, and welcome to our Crossroads Career Network uh, webinar this morning. I hope it's uh, worthwhile for you and, and uh, that you walk away with uh, some great new information and, and help. And you know what? I'm going to pause here because no one else has logged on yet. <laughs> there we go. Good morning. Welcome. We'll uh, wait for a few other people to uh, join us here. Want to welcome you here this morning. My name is Harry Urschel, and this is our uh, Crossroads Career Network webinar this morning. And I hope it's going to be worthwhile for you in terms of the uh, um, information you're going to get this morning and hope to, that you get some encouragement and inspiration for your job search and uh, that we give you some tools and ideas and, and uh, resources to be able to be more effective to land your next job. We're uh, glad that you're here and uh, we look forward to spending this time with you. Even though we're still online and we don't have the interaction that we have when we're in person, it's, it's good to uh, be able to, to see and, and uh, somewhat communicate with others as well. You know, part of our hope with Crossroads is that along with helping people succeed in their job search, we also talk about bigger issues and point people to the hope and encouragement of Jesus Christ. It should be no surprise that the Bible has a great deal of wisdom for life. And, you know, one of the challenges we all face in our lives today, in our relationships, in our careers, and in our job search, is to know what's true and right. Certainly what's thought of as right and what we hold to be true seems to change a lot in the world. Compare what the culture thinks is morally right and acceptable today to 20 or 30 years ago, and then you'll see there's stark differences. And how we talk about things in interviews and in the workplace are affected by those changes as well. So what do we trust? You know, God gave us a wealth of guidance and wisdom in Scripture that's pretty clear. And the claims in Scripture itself says uh, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. The question we have to ask ourselves is whether we primarily trust the creator, God, or do we primarily trust the culture around us? You know, unfortunately, the two are not compatible on many issues, so we have to pick which to follow. Once we make that decision, things become more clear to us and decisions become easier. We all make decisions based on what we trust to be true. Will God or our culture be the determining factor for you? My hope is that you put your trust in the God that created all things and has all wisdom and ultimately has authority over our eternities. In my opinion, it's pretty arrogant that we've now become more wise and sophisticated, quote unquote, uh, today and can determine what's right better than the wisdom handed down by God. Hope uh, that as you make decisions on your career and on your life and, and everything else that's uh, going on, that you look to one source, the source of wisdom that is valuable for you from throughout history to uh, rely on for the, that truth and for, for your decisions. You know, before I introduce our next speakers, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Lord, I'm grateful that we're able to come together even virtually here to this morning. And uh, we pray that you use this time for your purposes, that you give people the hope and encouragement that they need in their job search, that they, you give them wisdom and uh, understand that the truth that they can truly rely on comes only from you. Father, we uh, pray that you use this time and that everyone walks away with new hope and encouragement and ideas that will make a difference in the coming days and weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. And so with that, I'm really glad to introduce John McMunn. John has uh, actually been connected with Crossroads for quite a while, for a number of years. He's volunteered as a coach. He's uh, uh, spoken before on, on some of our presentations. He's uh, just, I consider him a friend. He's been a great resource for us and comes with a great perspective on life. And, you know, as he's gone through his own career, he's made decisions based on his faith. And he's going to talk a little bit about that this morning. And so I'm really glad to uh, have him here. John, I'm glad to have you join us. Can uh, come on screen. There we go. And uh, unmute. 
and I'm glad to uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Harry. I really appreciate the opportunity you're providing. And uh, for all the, those of you who are online here, it's an honor to be with all of you today. Um, I'll begin by telling a quick story. Um, in the 1940s, uh, actually 1930s into 1940s, a young boy was raised in rural Ohio by two parents who were Christians, devout Christians. And this little boy was raised obviously in a Christian home. And as he grew into grade school and junior high, it became apparent that this boy was gifted academically. And he was also Christ-centered. And as he got into his high school years, his parents were having conversations with him about his career direction someday, where he would go to college and beyond. And especially his mother wanted him to consider doing something in the mission field where he would preach the gospel to all the nations of the world. And he, wasn't, he was okay with it actually, this young boy, but um, he had another passion and that was aviation. He wanted to fly and he wanted to get into aeronautics. And so in these discussions, he said, mom and dad, I think that I can do both. I think that I can, you know, fulfill my passion to be a pilot and also be in the mission field. And so he did just that. And you can only imagine his parents' elation on June, excuse me, July 20th, 1969, when they watched their son, Neil Armstrong, standing on the lunar surface of the moon, sharing scripture to all the nations of the world. Now, my story is not that dramatic as far as living out my faith in my career, but that story has had a profound effect on me my entire life. I heard it back when I wasn't even a Christian. Then I became a Christian in my early 20s, and I thought about that story a lot. I became a Christian right after college in 1979, and um, I, was, I was from Pennsylvania, and I moved to the Midwest, and I'd never been out there, I was uh, awarded a job with a company called Litton Industries selling hand tools in the sales profession to the automotive aftermarket in four states, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, and Kansas. And as a young, early 20 year old guy with a company car and expense account and a brand new Christian, I had tons of temptations in my life at that point, And I fulfilled some of them. So one day I met with my pastor at my church as a young Christian, I said, listen, I'm a really good Christian on Sunday mornings, but I'm not too great the rest of the week. And he gave me some really profound advice that I use constantly in my life. And it, he said, you need to be upfront with people in your interactions. And, and when you're about to get into situations um, with people and with circumstances, you should say to people that I have a biblical worldview. So if I'm out, you know, whining and dining with people on a Saturday or a weeknight or anything that I could possibly do that would be compromising myself before I get in that situation. He said, tell people that you have a biblical worldview and you do things a little differently than a lot of people do. Now, he said, you'll get some, you'll get some um, pushback from your peers and from people. They'll probably tease you and they'll probably mock you some, but stay with it. Continue to say the words to people. I have a biblical worldview, so I'm probably not going to engage in that tonight or I have a biblical worldview. I'm not going to get in that situation. And he was exactly right. I started doing that consistently and I was mocked and ridiculed and, and teased, uh, but it was only for a short while. And then all of a sudden people started realizing this guy, John McMahon has, he's really a man of faith. And that teasing turned into respect. And it was interesting how many of those individuals came back to me months later, or a couple of years later and sat down with me one-on-one -on -one to say, hey, listen, um, I know you live your life a different way. I wanna hear more about it because I probably need to make some changes myself. So as you're listening to this, I, I would encourage you to really be strong in your faith and your convictions if, and, um, and to really say those words. I have a biblical worldview. That's, that's, and I tell you, you're in a culture, and Harry just alluded to this, you're in a culture right now that is anything but that. And so it's probably tougher than ever. But a biblical worldview is just simply to think, act, and love like Jesus. So in your daily life, a biblical worldview is to think, act and love like Jesus. And I did that in my career. It, and I was in the sales profession for a short while. And then I actually started my own business at age 30. And I um, had a business where I was doing executive coaching. And it was interesting because I sat down with a pastor one day as I started my business and my business was on shaky ground for the first couple of years. And I was thinking, you know, maybe I should get in the mission field. This was a different pastor. And he said, John, you are in the mission field. He said, when you're in the business community every day, 
at your mission field. He said, in fact, you can get in front of people and reach people that I could never get in front of as a pastor because I am a pastor. And uh, there are certain things that people won't approach me on where you, you're in the trenches with them. And I got very comfortable being in the mission field. I, I actually um, was very upfront with people when they would say, hey, John, you seem to have a good attitude. What, what's that all about? And I would let them know of a biblical worldview and I would share the gospel with them. And I did that throughout my, my time in, in, uh, when I had my business. Now, interestingly, um, I now live in Nashville, Tennessee, but for years, for 27 years, as a matter of fact, I lived up in uh, Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And I went to Grace Church in uh, Eden Prairie. And I sat through year after year after year after year missions conferences uh, twice a year where Dave Gibson, the mission director at Grace Church, would speak and have his uh, a lot of missionaries come in and speak. And they seem to always share this one verse over and over. Year after year, I listen to this verse. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Matthew 9, 37. And I heard that over and over as I had my own business. And I started to think, you know, someday I probably ought to do something in the mission field. It, because if it really is true that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few, I, I probably ought to get into that mission field at some point. But I had no idea what that would be. And then um, it just so happened that when I was in my 50s, and I'm age 65 today, in my 50s, I read a book called Halftime by Bob Buford. And the book is simply, it's a book about, in fact, the subtitle of the book is Moving from Success to Significance. So the analogy is, you're in the halftime of your life, you're in the locker room, if you will, and you've had a pretty successful first half, what are you gonna to do to make the second half significant, to really give back and to make it, um, make it more worthwhile, to be a servant leader? And I, I read that book and again, I said, you know, someday I'm gonna reach my halftime moment and I'm gonna to pivot to doing something more significant. Well, it just so happened that when COVID started, I had a client here in Nashville actually, um, who their sole purpose was they helped uh, opioid addicted mothers. They supported opioid addicted mothers. That's what they did for a profession. And they were a client of mine and they were a startup. And their purpose for bringing me on board as an outside consultant was to help them grow from Tennessee into Florida, into Kentucky and Texas, which we did. But when COVID started, I was making some phone calls to some of the mothers that we work with to let them know that we're gonna get them in in-person, excuse me, we're gonna take them from in-person AA meetings to online AA meetings. Um, and just so you're aware, when somebody's addicted to heroin, men or women, they love to go to in-person AA meetings. They, 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 sometimes they get addicted to AA meetings, quite frankly. But my purpose was to call these moms and say, we're gonna get you online AA meetings because of COVID. Well, I called a woman in my series of calls in Eastern Tennessee named Lisa, I said, Lisa, I'm going to get you on online to a meeting. She said, and by the way, Lisa is 32 years old, single mom, has a 10-year-old daughter, and she just lost her job as a waitress. And as I said, I'm going to get her on online meeting. She said, John, don't worry about me. I'm going to move to Nashville. I'm going to move from Eastern Tennessee to Nashville, and I'm going to give my daughter to my sister. And I unpacked that a bit. I said, well, what are you going to do in Nashville? And she said, I'm going to be a prostitute in Nashville, just like that. No apology, no shame, no nothing. I'm going to be a prostitute. Like, I'm going to get a job at a bank. That's what she said. And as I'm choking on that answer, I then just said, well, why would you give your daughter to your sister? And she said, because I'm tempted to traffic her. I'm tempted to traffic my 10-year-old daughter. And folks, I didn't even know what she was talking about. And I said, Lisa, I, I don't know what you mean to educate me. How would you even do that? What does that mean? And she said, I would take her to an amusement park called Dollywood, which is in Eastern Tennessee, on a Saturday morning, I'd ride some rides with her. Then I'd put her on a bench at one o'clock and say, honey, a man's gonna take your hand at 1.15 and you do whatever he tells you to do. And I would do that again at 3.30 and at six o'clock that night and the next day and the next day and the next day. And she said, I'm not sure I wanna do that. So I think I'm gonna give my daughter to my sister. Well, folks, that was my halftime moment. I decided at that moment, I am gonna stop my business and get in the mission field to fight human trafficking. And in fact, that's what I've done. I, for the last year and a half, I've been with an organization called Compassionate Hope, where I'm really living out my faith um, in fighting this, this horrible crime that is uh, it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world right now, and it's hidden in plain sight. What I just shared with you about Dollywood is happening at Mall of America, and it's happening at, um, at any amusement park near you.
and all kinds of public venues. So anyway, that's what I do now. So just some examples of living out your faith. Um, and that's how I've done it. And I'm now 65 years old. I'll do this the rest of my life. In fact, that one of the very first conversations I had when I was thinking about that is with Harry Urschel. And Harry, I'll give this back to you. But before I do, if there's one message I could leave you, it's just simply to start saying to people out loud, um, I have a biblical worldview. And that's, that just simply means to think, act, and love like Jesus on a daily basis. Again, thank you for this opportunity, Harry, and to uh, Crossroads Ministry. I appreciate it. John, thank you. As, uh, I've heard that story before from you, and, and it just hits me hard every time I hear it. It's just, you know, how people can that think that way and, and uh, you know, particularly their own child. And, and uh, I know that exists. And I, I just so appreciate the commitment and work that you've got into it. And the other idea of being very upfront with people. I, I uh, live by a biblical worldview to tell them that up front kind of sets the stage for everything else you do. And it keeps you accountable. You can't say that to people and then do something that uh, is, is contrary to that. And so uh, I, I like that idea and I'm, I may uh, start doing that myself. John, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Next, I'm really glad to be able to introduce, to do, excuse me, introduce Dave Sparkman. Dave uh, is currently the executive director for the National Crossroads Organization. Uh, leads that on a volunteer basis, but uh, prior to that was the chief culture officer for United Health Group and uh, um, has gained a little bit of experience and understanding of what uh, um, is a good fit for somebody in an organization and how uh, organization chooses people. And so his discussion this morning is going to be really helpful in terms of how do you distinguish yourself uniquely from all the other candidates that uh, a company is talking to. And so I'm really glad to uh, be able to introduce Dave and to be able to, for you to gain the uh, experience and, and uh, insight that he's going to offer this morning. Dave, thanks a lot. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Harry. And, and John, thank you very much. And before I jump in uh, to talk about our topic today, I want to highlight a couple things that um, hopefully you were also aware of with John's uh, presentation. Uh, number one, if you had asked me to guess John's age, I never would have guessed it, I never would have guessed 65. The energy he has is just incredible. And his view of life is, um, yes, I have past experiences, but it's not over yet. So both from an age energy perspective, as well as uh, there's no such thing as retirement uh, in scripture. And we're called to simply refire in some other areas. Uh, when we may leave a corporate career, um, there's always something to be done in, in the work of God. And that work can be done in many, many different ways. And, and John, I think it's wonderful that you're pursuing this with such passion. And I hope that uh, those couple observations may help some people out there today as well. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, subject that I have found myself uh, utilizing quite a bit over the last uh, several years. Uh, I'm going to get my slides ready to go here. It'll think just a little bit before it. Yeah, there we go. And, and it's around unique distinctives. What I have found in, in coaching, uh, as Harry and I and John have done and literally thousands of people over the years of our careers in, in different settings, is, is most people aren't really clear about who they are, uh, about what God, who God made them to be, about what God has prepared them to do. If we think about Ephesians 2.10, that we're prepared for good works before time even began as God's masterpieces uh, to do those works. And, and many times we get uh, go into the job that's just in front of us, uh, something happens, and, and that may be the right place, but oftentimes I find that people are um, un unemployed or they're unfulfilled. Uh, many Gallup polls have taken place over the years that show uh, a vast majority of Americans are not finding meaning in their work. They're not finding fulfillment. And I believe by looking at something uh, internally within themselves about their unique distinctives, that God not only create who God created them to be, but what God has given them 
in their past experiences uh, provide a confluence of, of possibilities where they can be distinctive to people and unique in a, in a completely different way. So to kind of set the stage for this, as you see on the screen, it's uh, why will people remember you? <laughs> and so when you think about uh, visually, a couple of examples, it's pretty easy to see visually which one of these are unique and distinctive from the rest of the crowd. Uh, a homogenous set of little, um, I guess they're little lifeboats and one is bright orange or here's the umbrellas and one's uh, burgundy. Here's the golf ball on a tee versus the others. It's pretty easy to see that, but yet as human beings, it's very difficult for a hiring manager or for a recruiter to ascertain, well, why are you, why are you different? What, what, why should I remember you? And this is far more, in my opinion, than your personal brand. It's, it's not a shtick that you put together uh, per se, although I believe personal brands are helpful and useful. Um, this gets a little deeper into the core of your background and, and actually requires a fair amount of work. And so as Harry and I were talking about a presentation that may be useful to people, uh, particularly in a different way, we came upon this one. So to set the stage, um, as with everything, and Harry started this out, we, we like to start with scripture within um, everything we do at, at uh, Crossroads Career. We believe all truth comes from scripture. There are many applications of this, and uh, this is one that I thought might be useful as a perspective to keep in mind. Second Thessalonians 1.12 says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness, and your every deed prompted by faith. And when I think about God's power in bringing to fruition your desire for goodness and your every deed, well, your, those are your actions. And when we look at, at work, and, and John mentioned this as well, our workplace is our mission field. We may decide to go to a full-time vocational ministry like John has done, but the vast majority of us uh, aren't going to do that. We're going to be in a corporate world. We're going to be um, in some type of vocation where we're constantly uh, touching other people and we're constantly doing things. And it really comes down to our motives and our actions. Why do we do what we do and who are we doing it for? And, and I believe if we're looking to glorify God in all things, this perspective to me was very useful and particularly as we think about uniquely uh, distinctive um, with the experiences that he's given you and the results that he's allowed you to achieve. I thought that might be a good grounding for us as we get started this morning. All right, let's keep, let's see how we can go to the next step. Hold on, ah. Now, when you think about the hiring process, it's actually a fairly simplistic uh, process. We're simply trying to match, and sorry about the screen uh, shielding a little bit, matching what I, as the candidate, do best to what they, the organization, needs most. Well, that's, that's very simple, uh, but it's also very, very complex. That assumes that it's easy for someone to see what the candidate does best. It it's, it's also assumes the candidate knows what they can do best. And what I found in, in literally thousands of conversations is most people underestimate what they do best. They're not really clued in to looking at everything they've got to bring to the table. And, and so on the one side as an individual, we're lacking in that process. And then what the organization needs most I've been in a very large organization, two very large organizations, Arthur Anderson and then United Health Group. And I can tell you without fail, um, those two organizations are, were top flight organ and are top flight organizations, but the hiring process is very messy. Uh, to think that every hiring manager knows exactly what they need, they positioned it accurately, um, that is just unfortunately not the case. Uh, I'll just pick on job descriptions because that's my favorite thing to pick on. Um, if you have been a hiring manager in the past and you have lost a person that you need to uh, find a new person for, you know that the top thing on your mind is probably not crafting the exact, uh, perf exactly perfect job description so you can attract a new candidate. You're just trying to figure out how do I get a body 
in this slot to do the work that's no longer being done so I don't have to do it. So at least my MO, and I know thousands of other hiring managers at those companies, is to simply take, go into the database of job descriptions and start cutting, pasting, and assembling. That's what my old profession was, a CPA, cut, paste, and assemble this into a new job description. And then it goes through an approval process and it becomes just a, a whole process unto itself. So by the time you are arriving as the candidate or the applicant to become a candidate, to then become the person, it's a watered down process as far as how well the company has really figured out what they need most. So there's a struggle on both sides. Obviously we can't control what the organization is doing but we can control how we present ourselves. And so what I wanna to submit to you today is not to um, go with just what the organization thinks they're asking for, but to present yourself in the very best manner that you can about what is going to work the best for you in your unique distinctions. So when we think about this, I mentioned there's a lot of things about ourselves. And, and as you look at this list, I think there are uh, 14 different uh, ways you could categorize yourself in, in knowing and in being able to articulate uh, what those areas are. So if I just asked uh, the random person what their core values are, probably 95% of the people cannot articulate those. Um, even the words that they use if they even know what I'm talking about with core values. If I started talking about their abilities, most would get a couple in and they'd start to stumble. And I include myself in this, by the way, as well. Uh, if I look about our dreams, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, that's a question that no matter if you're 20 or 70, I've had conversations with a lot of people at those ages about what they want to be when they grow up. Well, today we're going to talk about the distinctives. This, this word right here. Uh, just one of the 14 areas. And uh, we talk more about this topic, as you can see on the screen in our workbook under step three uh, of getting the right job. As we talk about aptitudes and attitudes, uh, getting us to altitudes, but we don't really go into uh, this area of unique distinctives. So this is just one of the 14 areas that we're going to go a little deeper in today. So here's the scenario. George has landed the interview. Well, congratulations, George. Wonderful that you've gotten beyond being an applicant and now you are a candidate. But guess what? So have three other people. And for those three other people to have gotten uh, or become a candidate, they have many of the same qualifications and skills and abilities and attributes that you probably do. I mean, they're not putting those people in front of the hiring manager just to put three more bodies out there, they actually think they are viable candidates, most likely. So what's gonna distinguish you from the other candidates? And in fact, the hiring manager is gonna interview George first and every candidate gets 30 minutes and they're gonna be sequential. So I'm gonna interview George at eight, I'm gonna interview candidate number two at 8.30, then one at nine, one at 9.30. When I'm done, why will the hiring manager remember George? Okay, and particularly when, if you're interviewing on Zoom, why are they gonna remember you when maybe it's a little more difficult to uh, allow a person or have a person connect with you on a, on a very personal basis? So that's the scenario that we're looking to uh, answer with the um, result of unique distinctions. Now, George's response, if he's like most people, are going to have some of these words perhaps in it. You know, I am in, in a, a wonderful team player. I collaborate very well as a leader. I gain consensus. I don't micromanage. Um, I under promise and over deliver. Um, I like the last one, I'm, I'm calm under pressure. And those are all fine words, but I call those billboard words. Those are words that you can splash up on, on the billboard and guess what? Every one of those other candidates can say the same thing. We don't know whether it's true or not, but that's what they're saying to advertise themselves as being the person that may uh, be able, hopefully that's how they're going to be remembered, right? 
And I would submit that there's a different way to do it through unique distinctions. So what are unique distinctions? I've uh, chosen this definition. I'm sure there's another way we could do it, but a group of attributes that when we put them together creates a valuable and memorable personal profile of you. In other words, when, when you leave that eight o'clock interview, there's something that you've been able to say and demonstrate that sets you apart from the other three people. What I have found is most people are not aware of how to, of what that what those are, nor are they able to articulate it, of course, if they're not even aware of it. It takes a little bit of work. So what we're going to do today is walk through some examples of, okay, Dave, you've rambled on now about unique distinctions. What exactly are you talking about? I don't want to be like George, who just throws out these um, phrases that anyone can, can use. And by the way, if you're on this uh, webinar and you're looking at your own resume, odds are pretty high that your resume contains some of those phrases. Nothing wrong with those phrases. I'm just suggesting that it won't be what captures the person's attention to add value, to make it memorable about you. And when we think about adding value and making it memorable, that's how they're going to remember you to apply to what they think they need most. So again, this is completely within your control of how you are able to present it. Okay, let's go to the next one. So to help us uh, get our arms around this, let's think about a Tesla. What are some features of a Tesla sedan that set it apart from other sedans? So my buddy Steve in, in Southern California bought a Tesla a couple of years ago. He actually has named his Tesla the Millennial Falcon. He's given me a ride in that Tesla. Steve loves the Tesla. And if I were to describe this Tesla to you about the features of it versus, let's say, a, uh, a, a Lexus or another luxury automobile, there are several features that distinguish it from a regular sedan, even if it's a luxury. So first of all, we know that a Tesla is an electric vehicle. Okay, so there's a huge battery in there. It doesn't take gas, but there are other, there are other electric vehicles. There are other hybrids. So if we just said, you know, let's go with an electric vehicle, that's not enough. That's, that's that broad word that doesn't get specific into the features, the product features. And by the way, if, if a Tesla doesn't resonate with you, think about another product that you have purchased that you love your own purchase. And you think about why did you purchase that product versus something else? But back to the Tesla. So a Tesla can go zero to 60 in about three seconds. When Steve demonstrated this to me, I literally was pressed back into my seat as we're going down the thoroughfare. And I'm like, whoa, first of all, we're breaking the speed limit. But I mean, it you felt the G-force of that acceleration immediately. So extremely fast acceleration, uh, acceleration. The look of the Tesla, it literally looks like a rocket ship. So maybe other sedans have that look or not, but remember it's the combination of these when they come together that create the uniqueness of the distinction that makes a Tesla a Tesla. Well, then you get inside the Tesla. It doesn't have a door handle. It has a little button that opens the door has another little button that closes the window. When you walk up to it, the latch is sleek and embedded within the body of the door. And when you reach or you press it, it clicks out for you to open the door. It is just slick. When you look at the dashboard, it is on a computer screen that's bigger than my computer screen that I'm looking at right now and that I work on every day. You can see the map of where you're going and with a touch, you can do a variety of things to get even more connected with what you're doing. Um, when this Tesla sits in the sun and starts to get a little hot, it air conditions itself so it doesn't overheat the battery. I mean, I could go on and on because of course, Steve has told me all these features about his millennial Falcon, all right? As you can tell, I haven't forgotten. I have had a memorable experience. I don't know about the value of that experience, but it was a memorable experience of being in that Tesla. Well, what is gonna help that hiring manager remember you as clearly as I can remember 
that Tesla. That's what we're going after. And that's what I think a lot of people don't do themselves the service that they could if they just took a little bit of time. And that's what we're going to explore a little bit more this morning. Now, I think as we get into that, some of it's the challenge. I think we need to talk openly about the challenges of why, why is this difficult? Why don't people think of themselves perhaps in the way that they could to be able to naturally present their unique distinctions? And I've just listed a few of them here. We've already hit some of them. Um, number one, we don't really like to think of ourselves as a product. We like to think of ourselves as unique individuals. And that of course the hiring manager is gonna consider our personality and the vibe that we give off and whether they wanna have a drink with us after work. I mean, whatever it is. But folks, it, it, when you're in the hiring mode, you're trying to focus on, yes, those things, but can the person get the work done? And as much as I might like George or Jerry or Sally, uh, am I going to remember them? Another thing is that most people are not very good at selling themselves. Uh, I, I would consider myself to be one of them. I am not a sales guy, right? I, I look at uh, people who are eloquent. And when I listen to John talk, he's he, you can see the passion coming through the screen as he was talking about what he's now involved in. And I can just imagine in his corporate career how that came out as well. Well, you combine that maybe we're not naturally good at selling um, with some of these other challenges and it, it is a pitfall that is not gonna do us service very well. Uh, we're much better at generalizations than specifics. Um, when people talk to us about most things in our life, and, and I, I get this from my kids at times, you know, all that other stuff. Well, what other stuff? Well, you know, it's just like, in, and they start just going around the edges. Uh, have, have you ever gotten into a, um, a political discussion? Just to light this, and no, Harry, I'm not going to go into politics, but just you get into a political discussion and some people are so well-versed on the issues that they're arguing. And the other person is just not. They say a blanket statement about whatever the issue is. And then they kind of say, well, where'd you get that? And they, they got it from some news channel. And it's a, it, they, they basically can repeat the headline, but that's it. Whereas the other person is quoting statistics and data and research and even definitions. And it makes for a very lopsided argument. And I believe that's because most human beings there's so much information out there. We just take the generalization. We know what, we think we know what we think. And so we just rest on that and move on. Here's one that, uh, boy, if, if you're not practicing for an interview, if you're not practicing what you're going to say, uh, number one, you're in good company. Most, pe most people don't do that, but what a huge opportunity to distinguish yourself by practicing what you're about, what you want that hiring manager or recruiter to hear. Um, another challenge is the technology uh, becomes the driver versus us, okay, as the candidate. What do I mean by that? Well, if, if you look at the uh, automated tracking systems, ATS systems within most companies of screening out candidates, uh, that has become so, um, what's the right word? So it, it's, it's everywhere, right? with most companies. And so we've adapted our approach to make sure we match up to the ATS system versus putting our best foot forward about what we do best. Because if we don't, we're gonna get screened out. We won't even make it to the hiring manager to have that conversation. So how do we do that? I think you still have to manage through that with keywords. I'm not discounting any of it. I would simply say there's a way to do it on your resume and still put your best foot forward with unique distinctions. And I'm gonna to get to that in a, in a little bit. So I would just suggest we not let technology run us, but let it be the supporting tool and utilize it as such. And the last challenge I think we face is we're used to blending in. You know, How many times have we uh, perhaps told our own kids, hey, don't do that, you know, because they're making, uh, they're becoming, <laughs> Obnoxious is the word that came to mind. I have four children. They're not obnoxious anymore, but there were times when they had a little bit of a, a sidekick to them that we needed to pull back. But typically we are, again, homogenous as human beings. We're, we're kind of told to blend in, not make waves. 
become part of the crowd. Well, now you're trying to set yourself apart because you're trying to sell yourself, right? So those are just some of the challenges that I think it, uh, or barriers that make it not natural for us to think this way. And I'm hoping that using the Tesla example, you may be able to shift your thinking to get a different result. So let's take a look at this. Um, and I, I would encourage you to put on a new lens uh, so that as we look through, you can see things a little more clearly uh, about these unique distinctions. And we're gonna pull and look at a couple of examples. Uh, and these are real people. I've changed the names to protect their identities. But these are folks that were in my small group at North Coast Church in Southern California this past winter. And I took uh, extracts of their resumes directly off their resume. Um, and you'll see things that you would obviously want to change in the resumes, which they've done. Um, but these were their resumes as I received them. And as you look for it, these are uh, on the top half of the first page that I extracted this information. So the first person we're going to look at, uh, we're going to call him Ben. And I'm just going to give you a second to uh, read this information. That word over there is personnel, and I'll let this go back. Um, he, ben was a flight dispatcher, customer service rep, a couple of years. Uh, you can see here that he listed out a variety of things that he did as to the task that he was charged with. Um, I'm not going to read every one of them, but um, overall, he, it's kind of in a bullet point format. You can see that he, he starts with an action verb. Um, you'll see that there are not really any results in here, so it's tough to see whether Ben did a good job or a bad job, but, and also Ben is now applying for other call center type of uh, jobs, okay? So he certainly has experiences that uh, probably would say that he could do the job, but again, if you go back to our scenario, if he's the first candidate, what is something here that they're going to remember him on versus the other three? Maybe because he was a flight dispatcher. Uh, it, it was a, around an airport that he was, they may associate that with him, but they may not. All right. So this is just, again, top half of the first page from Ben, a real person that we were looking at how to help him improve his resume and improve is to then get to an interview to then be able to get the job. Now, one thing I, I would also um, tell you that is my bias when I go through and look at resumes in, in trying to put your best foot forward to show them what you do best to hopefully match what they need most. The top half of the first page is probably the most important piece of real estate on the resume. When someone does finally get to looking at the resume, where do they start? They start at the top, they read left to right, they have limited time, whether it's online or in, if they have the hard copy in their hands, they're scanning it, they're trying to pick up something that enables them to think that you may be the right person, okay? It's always rushed. People rarely take the time to carefully read through and try to extract what you're really trying to say, all right? So that's point one. Point two on a resume is I believe the resume is the calling card then that sets the stage for the interview. Interviewers may have things in mind that they want to ask you. You know, they may do behavioral interviewing and ask you about your greatest accomplishment or where you've been adaptive or where you've been innovative. Most people are not very good at behavioral interviews and most people will look at the resume and ask you questions for further clarification about what you write down. So I believe a huge lever that most people don't take full advantage of is literally in their hands to present to the hiring manager or the recruiter, and they miss that opportunity. They don't take advantage of the real estate. They don't take advantage of putting something down that's going to be the capture of their interest. So on the next slide, I'm going to I'm cutting the corners on this because this took about an hour of conversation with Ben to get to this answer. Um, I typically like to ask people, what would they, after I explain unique distinctions, how would they come up with it? Because I think as their mind walks through it, they get one more confidence about who they are. 
and, and the experiences that God gave them and who God created them to be. But obviously we don't have an amount of time here, so you're gonna get the end result. So there were other things on Ben's resume that we felt deserved to be in that top half of the first page. It turns out that, hey, he's uh, Ben, uh, I'm gonna go to point two. Uh, ben is part of Mensa International. This was buried on the last page. I mean, he went to about a page and a quarter. It was on the, the second page that he was part of uh, Mensa International as part of his volunteer activities. Uh, for those of you not aware of what Mensa International is, you, you have to qualify for Mensa with an IQ test that proves you're at some stratosphere that I'm not even close to, okay? I don't know what the number is, but I'm not close to it. Ben was in there. Ben is a very, very, very smart individual, okay? Now that you may say, well, that's not, that's book smart. That's not practical smart. That may be true, but Ben has got a lot of horsepower up here and that is memorable, potentially memorable to a hiring manager. Number two, he was a graduate um, in business from Alabama. He's in Southern California. He went to school in, at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and he was also a business strategy game champion. This was at the bottom of page one. And when we talked about, well, what does that mean? What's, what is business strategy game champion? He said, well, all the business majors are eligible to participate in this business strategy game. Um, and I, I won it. We're like, okay, tell us more. Well, you get in and through a, a variety of scenarios, it's an online game, you make decisions, those decisions using artificial intelligence roll through and give you outcomes. And you then stra strategize literally how you run the business with real, real time economic uh, data, people quitting, people coming in, all of these things. And he's pushing the buttons that where he became the champion. Well, I know a lot of business majors. <laughs> I was one. And we didn't have a game like this when I went through uh, college. But to me, this was something very unique that proves he has some business chops about him to get uh, the right decisions, sorting through a lot of different uh, options. So we felt that that was unique and it was not being highlighted. And then last, if you recall in the previous slide, there were no, no results mentioned. So we started talking to him about, well, when you were the flight dispatcher and you were in this call center, what, how did they evaluate whether you were any good or not? We found out, oh, there's, there's customer ratings. And he had a 95% quality rating, which also, by the way, put him in the top 10% of the other CSRs. So when you put that together, and if this was at the top half of the first page of the resume, it starts to generate a conversation it can't help but leave the hiring manager or recruiter with an impression of, of Ben that they simply want to know more about and they're going to remember. So yes, some it, it, th this would be an area that you could create. You may embed it within your accomplishments, but there are words in here and I'm gonna, you're gonna see it even more uh, pronounced in the next example where you don't want it just to be a series of job uh, experiences that have results. Those are accomplishments or achievements. Those are very necessary. Uh, that does help set you apart. But Mensa International, for example, wouldn't fit necessarily uh, in your accomplishments, although it, it could be categorized that way. Um, when we're thinking of those three to five unique distinctions that when put together, remember the definition, create a valuable and memorable personal profile. So right now, you all have hopefully shifted your thinking of Ben from what you saw at the first half of the first page that I showed you earlier to now. You have a sharper, more clear view of what he might be able to bring to the table. So let's go to another example. Sheila. Sheila is also in my small group. Um, this literally was on the top half of the first page. I copied it verbatim. Um, and of course we said immediately, this is too much, <laughs> it's overwhelming and you needed to get it into bullet points in some ways. But if you just take a moment and read that, you know, she has over 10 years of experience. Um, she 
characterizes herself as having expertise in analyzing and transforming strategies of companies. She's had success in fundraising, um, positive environments. Oh, there's relevant goodwill, which you know is kind of a fuzzy topic. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, okay, 13 million annual revenue. It's actually not a very big company. Um, eight years experience in company and crisis public relations. I mean, you start to see that, all right, I'm not really sure what Sheila may be looking for because she has a broad variety of experiences here. Uh, she has a bachelor of liberal studies is what BLS stands for from Purdue University. Okay, a reputable, obviously a, a organization. So hopefully you've had a chance to read this and you look at it and you go, okay, what, what am I going to remember about Sheila other than what you know, we put in bold as a project manager for events? Certainly not something that I see unique distinctives on. Um, what could those be? Well, here's, here's what after again, about 45 minutes of conversation we were able to pull out. Turns out that she uh, was really deep into the entertainment business. And most of the things that she was involved in uh, were in smaller organizations with uh, entertainment, music, uh, acting, production. Uh, you can see on the top one that uh, she was very innovative in, in taking a concept and making it real, which gave results from four to 10 million and actually won an award, okay? This was on the bottom of page one of her resume. Um, turns out she was an event planner for very notable uh, large events, Coachella, Sundance, SXSW in, in Austin. And there were ideas and processes that she was able to change in her role as an event planner that led to revenue increases of 15%. If you're familiar with those um, events, you know that these are not um, you know, mom and pop selling strawberry jam on, on the shore of a beach. I mean, these are huge events, thousands of people. She designed and implemented a fundraising uh, program for a nonprofit raising over 650,000. Now that I'm involved in a nonprofit, um, I find fundraising very difficult and to even conceptualize how I ask people for money. And so I, I'm gonna go back to uh, Sheila and ask for more advice here. And then buried at the bottom on page two, turns out there's an Emmy Award that she won uh, for a studio production pro uh, project that she put together. So here's, oh, and, and I didn't even put in here that a number of things that she did were with name brand uh, bands, Kansas, Boston, Queen, Rolling Stones, she had to make those bands happy when they came to these events. So whether it was the food, the accommodations, the travel, she had to oversee all of that to make sure that all of those personalities were pleased and wanted to come back and perform at their best at these different events. So another way that you could have put uh, some of those different bands to get some immediate recognition and affiliation that were not even present, and they're still not present on her resume. That only came through conversation. So hopefully you have a feel for, man, I'm gonna remember Ben and Sheila differently than what their resume originally presented. And I'm gonna remember them differently than just listing out some uh, accomplishments because we wanna highlight things that are unique to them. So how do you do that? Uh, Dave, you talked about you know, a time frame that it may take to have conversation about it. And so uh, here are some hints. Uh, it does taking look, it does taking take looking at yourself through a different lens. Uh, and so for me, always when I'm trying to look at myself through a different lens, I ask others because it's hard for me to look at myself because um, I'm used to the lens that I look at. And you can see if you've all been to the eye doctor and they say, this is it's lens A or lens B better lens C or lens D, one or two, and you're making those choices, you're gonna get a sharper and more clear image the more different lenses that you look through, which inevitably come, in my view, from other people. The other things that you can look at are, are noteworthy experiences, exceptional results, intriguing scenarios, iconic images 
that you're able to frame in a person's mind. And remember, it's the combination of things. These are not broad generalizations. These are specific things that ultimately only you can say that you've done. A lot of people can say they increased revenues 15%. They can't say they've increased revenues 15% at Sundance, Coachella, and SXSW, right? So it's the association of the results with the experience that make it unique to you. All right, almost finished here. We're gonna open up for questions. So ultimately the end result, what you lay out for the recruiter and hiring manager enables them to solve the equation better. Again, you still need to think through and, and ensure you have keywords. That's very useful, but I would always put out unique distinctions and accomplishments above keywords because ultimately when you get into another presentation I'm gonna do later this summer on cultural fit, if you're not putting your best foot forward with what you do best and you manage to get a job just because you match keywords, you could find yourself in a very unfortunate situation of being unhappy in the work that you're doing and not performing it very well. So to me, your resume, the interview process, everything you wanna put your best foot forward, help the company, the organization, see what you do best, realize that they need it most, all right? Not what they may have hodgepodge together through a job description. Have confidence in yourself, work the system, but ultimately you need to have it work for you because when you do, the results are very worth it and nobody cares about this as much as you should, right? Because ultimately, bottom line, you're the one that's gonna be in that job and you're the one that's gonna to have to work with that hiring manager to get the things done that need to get done. So this does take a little bit of effort, a little bit of time. I can promise you it's well worth it. Um, and you'll continue to refine it. it. It may not be the first time that you come up with all the sleek features of the Tesla. It may not be as easy as that, but every person I've talked to, when we get through that conversation, they emerge with a different perspective about themselves than they had before it. And it's not because I'm magical with this stuff. It's just because I'm a different lens and I'm asking questions and I'm trying to draw out more of what they were able to accomplish, more of um, getting curious about what their backgrounds and histories have been, I think that start to draw out uh, how they are uniquely distinctive. Again, we come back to 2 Thessalonians 1.12. How do we do it where our deeds, our acts and deeds are glorifying, are most glorifying to Christ? He gave us these experiences. He gave you gifts of skills and abilities that you have worked toward, but he allowed those opportunities. How can you use them to best glorify him in the workplace, which is, as John mentioned, your mission field? Appreciate you listening. Uh, we're going to open it up for some questions. I'll stop sharing and uh, Harry, if you wanna come back, we can start to have a little discussion. Sounds great, Dave. Uh, please do put uh, any questions or comments into the chat box and we'll address them with you. Um, you can type those in at any time and I'll, I'll read them off here. But uh, Dave, there were so many great points I thought you had in there. And, and uh, you know, one of them earlier in the presentation was I, I think so true, people want to put um uh you know achievements or or personality traits into their resume or in their discussion that uh would set them apart but so often they use the same phrases that everybody else uses and uh it really doesn't set them apart you know you think uh it sounds really positive to say you're a great team player or a, a servant leader or all kinds of things phrases that people use but uh you know high percentages of resumes say exactly the same thing. And so you really want to look at, as you said, you know, what makes you really unique and not just use uh, um, overused phrases. Someone's uh, typing in, do you have any specific uh, suggestions for formatting your resume to accomplish this and avoid redundancies? Uh, yes, I, I think that Many people in their resumes um, have been coached to put a, a goal or an objective at the top of the resume. Uh, they've been coached to put specific skills and then you have bullet points of specific uh, skills that they may have. 
Um, I don't find a lot of value in that. Uh, again, to me, I think it just becomes a, uh, a word exercise to match up to job descriptions for the ATS system. So I'd suggest a format that literally puts your unique distinctions at the top. And some of those you may be able to put into accomplishment. You know, here's your name and contact information at the top. And then at the very, the next thing that hits them are those accomplishments or unique distinctions. How do you create that, that immediate impression? Because remember, they're reading the resume very quickly that they go, whoa, I want to read more. I'm sure we've all read books where the first chapter um, just grabs us. That first scene grabs us. And we've also read books where, you know, you, you kind of slug your way through it. And maybe you're glad you slug your way through it. But a lot of times I don't have time to slug my way through it. So think of the hiring manager and what's going to provide the most value to them, particularly in telling them about yourself. So if I'm trying to sell myself, I want my best features in the top half of that first page. And so those are a few thoughts. I mean, Harry, you see thousands of resumes. I mean, what uh, comes to mind for you on, on formatting? You know, there's actually been um, studies done in terms of uh, uh, tracking recruiters' eyeballs in terms of what, what are they looking at at a resume first. And uh, invariably, they jump to the work history first. And so while it is a good idea to have some um, summary or, or, you know, key points at the top of your resume, realize that they're probably going to jump to your work history first because they're trying to figure out pretty quickly, do you have experience, recent experience that's related to the job they're trying to hire? That's the first thing they need to know. And so what you have in your uh, first job listing is as important, if not more important, um, than anything that you put on the top. And so, you know, your first couple of bullet points and how you describe your current or most recent role is critically important as well. And so, um, you know, thinking through what you have uh, as summary or key achievements on the top is good, but make sure those things jump out in your work history as well. Um, you know, as we talk about this, Dave, I think sometimes people have a hard time figuring out what is it that makes me unique? You know, I, I do strictly senior executive search for companies. And as I talk to even people that have been very successful and gone far in their careers, a lot of times they don't have a great deal of self-awareness. You know, I think many times at that senior executive level, they've kind of uh, nurtured a story over the years that works for them and sounds good, but it's not necessarily genuine and authentic about who they are. And uh, it's, uh, it is important to really do some of that self-examination. What's, you know, without spending uh, days or weeks uh, uh, examining your your navel, how do you uh, how do you figure out what what has set me apart or what does make me different? Yeah, and and I found the same thing, Harry, in in my career at, at Anderson and at uh, United Health Group. Very successful people. Um, don't don't really know themselves very well. So if you take those those 14, a list of 14 things, and let's just pick on a couple. So for example, uh, what are your strengths? Well, there's an assessment tool called Strengths Finders. It takes 10 minutes. And it's important to realize that one assessment tool is not the all end all, it's simply data, but it can start to help you understand more clearly about who you are. Um, so I've, I actually have a file of different assessments that I've taken over the years and it just, you throw them in there and, and that is, is one quick and easy way to do it. Another one is to ask others input, um, just to say, uh, and we actually have a little, a little form for that, that you can uh, utilize from our website where it's, it's called ask others input and just to get feedback from other people as to how they see you. There's a, we all, we all are aware of blind spots, <laughs> but we really don't pay that much attention to trying to figure out what those blind spots are. And, and yet when you think about it from a, uh, an automobile driving experience, if we're not paying a, a attention to our blind spots, it literally can get us killed. And I don't think most business executives are thinking of it in that level of severity. They think, well, I, I know I have blind spots, but you know, everybody does, and people will know that I have blind spots and, and then give me a, 
you know, get out of jail free card. No, they don't. And, and they can have severe consequences. And the more that we're able to discover what those blind spots are, well, then we're going to be better drivers. We're going to be able, better able to navigate uh, through our work experience. So those are two things that you could do. Um, there's many, many more out there. But and part of it is just also spending a little time reflecting. Maybe it's just journaling about yourself. You think of an experience that went really well for you. Why did it go well? What did you bring to the table? Okay, now one that didn't go so well. What was your part in that? And to just have an objective conversation with yourself and start to potentially journal some answers will start to give you some insights on how you can navigate. I think that last uh, part is especially valuable going through your career history and thinking through, you know, when, when have I felt in the groove in my career where I th felt like things were clicking and, and uh, things were going well and I felt most uh, fulfilled or most successful. And why is that? Who was I, who were I, were the people I was working with and what were the relationships like? Who was I reporting to and what was that relationship like? And, um, you know, and then the flip side of that, when were, when was I feeling really awkward in my career or things that just weren't clicking and what contributed to that? And it's, uh, I think you can learn a lot from your own history. And a lot of times people don't do that uh, and self-analysis. I think it's uh, very helpful. Yeah. Any other questions, comments for Dave? Well, one, one last thing, Harry, um, we have a new workbook as part of from Crossroads Career, you can see it on our website. It's a whopping $8 where we uh, have this unique distinctions along with several other things that can help you create a better uh, canvas. We call it a, a calling canvas. Uh, the name of the workbook is Hear God Calling You. And it's a practical and tactical way to start to dive deeper into who God made you to be. So it gets into your identity, your life purpose, your values, your your uh, vocational calling, your unique distinctions. So a number of things that were on that um, slide with the 14 different things we get into, and we help someone put it all together so they can see on one page who they are and, and what they believe God has given them as far as experiences and gifts and skills and abilities to, to be and do. So um, I encourage people to check that out for more resources in a, in a very practical way. Uh, longitudinally to get uh, more insight. It's a, a great point. And if you, for all of you that are watching, if you haven't checked it out, be sure, you know, obviously in addition to our local website, mncrossroads.com, be sure to check out the national website, crossroadscareer.org, because there's a ton of valuable resources and, and tools and additional help there as well. The, the uh, blog that they write each week is incredibly helpful. And this, they've recently wrote on this topic on there as well. And so you can view that in, uh, compared to his, his uh, presentation. It was a comment, Dave, uh, that your presentation, it was uh, very helpful. And thank you for that. And I agree. It was, there was great information there. Really good to think about. I think a lot of times we go into the interview and we try to do our best and that's terrific, but we forget we're being compared to multiple other people. And, and uh, you know, when we lose an opportunity, it's not that many times that we didn't do anything wrong and we did the best we could and everything right, but you just never know who your competition is. And they right. often bring something unique or different to the table that you just didn't have. And that's not, not a fault of yours at all, but uh, at the same time, you want to make sure that you bring those unique distinctives out for yourself. Dave, thanks so much. Really pleasure. grateful for your time and, and glad that uh, you're able to, to, uh, give that insight. Well, thanks for having me today, Harry. Terrific. Um, you know, as I look at who is attending today, I realize that each of you have been online before for our previous webinars. So I'm not going to go through the entire um, uh, overview of what's offered through Crossroads. I think you've gotten that information uh, perhaps multiple times before, but I do want to emphasize a couple of things. And uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen here just to be able to do that. And uh, we'll then wrap up a little bit earlier here today. But uh, 
Thanks. Certainly, I'm glad you're on these webinars, but I certainly encourage you to take advantage of the other resources we have available. And on a weekly basis, there's multiple ways you can plug in. And, you know, as much as the content and the context you may be able to get and, and uh, the uh, information that would be helpful in your job, fair, uh, job search is important, I think getting plugged in to these other things is so important also because you, that weekly or regular um, check-in with others, that encouragement, hope, the uh, light accountability, all help in your job search. It can be a very lonely process, as you may have already experienced. And it's certainly an uh, emotional roller coaster going up and down with uh, good news and bad news throughout your whole job search process. And the more you can get encouragement and community with others and being able to practice your communication skills really makes a big difference in terms of uh, um, being more even keeled throughout this job search process and hopefully get to the goal faster. And so our Networking with Grace networking group that meets every Thursday morning at nine o'clock, it's online through a Zoom meeting, so you can each communicate with each other. Uh, I really encourage you to do that. Wes Roper and Wes Tang lead that. Um, some of you already are familiar with that, with them, but they do a terrific job of making sure everybody uh, gets encouraged and gets something to walk out with each day, uh, each meeting. We also have other people from companies around the area that have been more recently plugging in and um, helping with the networking process, but also talking about positions they have open at their companies that they're trying to recruit. So it's a great way to uh, get input from a number of different sources. They, uh, If you go onto the website and look up the networking section, you can uh, see the information and register there. And I encourage you to take advantage of that as often as you can. We can, uh, one of our volunteers can uh, work with you one-on-one -on -one for coaching and encourage you to take advantage of that as often as you'd like. You can sign up on the website. Somebody will follow up with you to set up a time for a Zoom meeting or a phone call, whatever you prefer, and talk through any aspect of your job search. And uh, maybe it's just a chance to talk uh, to somebody through your situation to kind of uh, vent your uh, uh, current uh, uh, scenario and, and help get some insight from them. It might not be anything very specific, but you just need somebody that understands what uh, challenges you're facing and, and uh, be able to talk through that with them. So take advantage of that. It's a great way to get some additional individual help. Um, as we've talked about many times, but uh, we do have a group of people that love to pray for you. And uh, our prayer support team is uh, accessible online. You can enter information there for a prayer request and somebody will follow up to tell you that they've been praying for you. If you feel like you need more emotional or spiritual help on an ongoing basis, we have a, a soul care group of people that will meet with you on a more regular basis one-on-one -on -one and talk through your situation and give you some spiritual encouragement and hope as well. So take advantage of those things. They're there because people care and want to be able to help. And as you may know, is the uh, eight week small group classes is the best way to get the most in-depth and ongoing help. We cover every aspect of a job search that's important, but also again, as equally important to the content is that light accountability, encouragement, moral support. You know, you may have already, um, taken part of it in it in the past, you can certainly do it again. The content hasn't changed dramatically, but um, you know, getting a new group of people, getting that encouragement each week, I think is so critically important. So many people kind of go down a rabbit hole emotionally in this process, and then they're not the best when they're actually at a networking meeting or at an interview. And so there's some great uh, support and help that way. Throughout the eight weeks, we do talk about God's perspective of your job search in your life. And I think that is equally important in this whole process. Classes are starting mon monthly. We actually, we have, I believe we actually, we have a class starting tonight. You can jump in or you can start next week if it doesn't work for you tonight, but uh, um, sign up online and uh, you'll get all the details for it. You can find out how it all works on the website and uh, take advantage of it. I really uh, hope that it's uh, um, a tool that is going to be useful for you in many, many ways. Um, our LinkedIn group, you've, I won't spend time on this, but if you haven't checked it out, be sure to do that. Just put in MN Crossroads Career Network and there you'll find help from other people there. There's over well over 2,000 people that have been alumni of 
crossroads and being willing to be uh, networking contacts at the organizations they work at now. So take advantage of that. We will put this webinar as well as all of our others go on to our YouTube channel so you can review them there and get additional information. And so put in MN Crossroads Career Network in the YouTube, YouTube search box, you'll find us there. And uh, this will be posted uh, online later today. Um, Thrivent has been a great partner for us. They do uh, financial considerations during job transition webinars, three different ones a month, and you can find details on the website. And it's a great way to think through your finances and, and budgets and every, all the other challenges you have uh, through, through uh, um, their help. And it's, these are great practical tips and help for that process. I just want to acknowledge, as I always do, there's a lot of people, actually, we have over 40 people that volunteer for Crossroads in one way or another. And uh, I'm just grateful for all of them because they all bring expertise and a heart to help people. And uh, they contribute in different ways that really make a difference and enable us to, to provide all the resources we do. So I, I want to uh, just acknowledge that uh, they, they uh, all contribute to making this happen. If you don't have a church home, be sure to check one of our local churches that uh, that are aligned with Crossroads. It's a great way to get plugged in and get additional spiritual support. I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad that uh, uh, Dave was able to contribute and John as well, and I hope it was uh, useful for you. And I hope that, uh, let me stop share here, hope you get plugged into other avenues of getting help through Crossroads and check out both the local and national websites to be able to get more resources. Thanks guys and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Hope to see you at some of our other events. Oh, our next um, uh, webinar is gonna be coming up uh, and I should have all this prepared, I'm sorry, I, but uh, it's the first Thursday of the month. Be sure to check uh, out the details on our website and sign up for our next webinar coming up uh, Thursday morning, first Thursday morning of July. Thanks again. Have a great day.